Matthew chapter 11. Those of you that are contemplating making the trip to Jordan and Israel with us, uh, we're getting a good number signed up. I got a report uh, yesterday from uh, our tour company and uh, the man who owns the company and will be our guide is in Israel himself right now, will be till the end of August, but uh, he is working on getting a group rate flight out of Vegas for y'all, and uh, that'll be good. Let me uh, just, uh, where'd, where'd Brother Doug go? What's our heathen? My soul and body. He hadn't heard this. This is, this is new. I mean, he hadn't. I won't charge him extra. Uh, but uh, I, I really did not want him in here. I was just going to tell him to put his fingers in his ears. But uh, I, I wish that you as a church would do everything you can that uh, he and Ms. A.J. can go with us. Uh, he has been with me before, and uh, it has helped his preaching, and his preaching needs help. <laughs> and so we uh, let me encourage you. I'm going to do everything I can personally to make sure that uh, he and Miss A.J. can go. She's never been with us. She did not get to go with us, did she, Doug? And uh, it, is, it is really exciting. At the end of the service, we're going to show four pictures. I really don't know what order uh, Miss A.J. sent them to you, but uh, if I'll sit down and let you show it, and then I'll know what to say when, when I see it. So that, that'll be a good thing. Matthew chapter 11. Very, very familiar uh, three verses, but I want us to spend some time uh, the title of my message tonight is The Necessity of Coming to Jesus. Not serving. Not serving Jesus. That's necessity too. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the necessity of coming to Jesus. I'm not talking about salvation. That's important. But I'm talking to us as Christians about us coming to Jesus. Now, I don't know if your Bible is like mine, but we know Jesus is speaking this because it's in red, like they had red print back when they wrote the Bible. But anyway, as you read the whole context of Matthew 11, you know this is our Lord Jesus speaking. Notice what he says, Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. But then notice what he said in verse 30. For I'm in the King James, the only version there is of the Bible. 20, oh, I'm sorry, what verse? I thought you said what version? 28, 28, 29, and 30. Let's start over again, all right? <laughs> Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now notice verse 30. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I don't know how many folk I talk to and have talked to over the years that said, you know, it just sounds scary. It sounds extremely difficult to give your whole life to Christ. To absolutely, totally surrender, to take your hands off your life and give it to Jesus. That's just scary. To the human mind, that's true. To the spiritual mind, that's the smartest decision that an individual could ever make. And the way Jesus puts this is so wonderful. He said, now, I want you to take my yoke upon you. Man, that sounds like work. 
I want you to get yoked up with me. Remember uh, Bible days, they would take the ox and they would yoke them together. Two ox would be yoked together. And they would pull or they would plow. They would work. So what he's saying here is, I want you to yoke up with me. Now it's amazing. You know, in my mind, I sort of picture it like the Lord Jesus being uh, one of these great big workhorses, Clydesdales, and you and I being Shetland ponies. Who's going to do the most pulling? He is. That's why he could say, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, but notice what he says about himself. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You know, that's not the picture that so many preachers preach about Jesus as the conquering king and the commander-in-chief of everything, and, but yet Jesus said about himself, I am meek and lowly in heart. Then he said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So therefore, if I give him my burdens, they become his. And the Bible says that we're to cast all of our care upon Him because He cares for us. Did you know it, it's really when you read it, and like in Psalm 37, it's a sin for you and I as Christians to worry. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, throughout Matthew, excuse me, Psalm 37 says, fret not thyself. That's an old term, fret not. You know what it means? Stop your worrying. Don't be overly concerned about it. I have um, a young man. Well, he's 50 years old now. That's young. And uh, what my son told me one time, he's 50 also. He said, he said, you know, Dad, I, I'm getting old. I said, son, I got food in the refrigerator as old as you are. <laughs> but uh, Will Rice fine young man I've known him his whole entire life and he's having some heart problems 50 years old he's an evangelist and uh, I sent him a text yesterday and I think I've mentioned this here before but I said Will I want you to understand something the Trinity has never met in an emergency session Nothing ever takes them by him by surprise. He sent me back an answer, and he said, Uncle John, thank you so much for that encouragement. You know, you and I, when we think about Jesus and what he is to us, what he does for us, we ought to be encouraged. Boy, when you think about this, you're never alone. Why? He said, I'll never leave you nor will I ever forsake you. When I started studying the Bible after I was saved, I read that in Hebrews 13, and I thought, that's sort of redundant. I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. But it's two different Greek words. He says, I'll never leave you. That means there's no place in all of creation that you could ever go that Jesus isn't with you. He never forsakes you. That word forsake there means, I'm going to give you a Texas term, all right? I won't leave you in the lurch. When there is a need, I'll be there to supply it. So he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. And now he asks me, come unto me you and I are truly living in a time when people are not considering God or the Lord Jesus or the Holy Spirit and if anything if they're considering them it's considering them less and less in their everyday life 
I've been encouraging my grandchildren. And by the way, I, I pray every morning. And at night when I go to bed, I pray every night for my children, my grandchildren. I pray for them by name. One of the things that I pray for them morning and night is that somehow God could cause them to be conscious of His presence with them. Don't raise your hand. But have you ever spent a whole day and you come to the end of the day and you start thinking about maybe the day and you realize, I hadn't thought very much about God today. He has not been in my thoughts very much today. And it is not normal for us to think that way. It's natural for us to do it. It's natural for us not to be aware of God, but we have to do the supernatural. And just by disciplining your mind to do that. One of the ways that has helped me is uh, I look for the little ways God blesses me. Just the little ways God blesses me. I was backing out of my garage at home uh, a few weeks ago. And I always look at my backup camera and I look this way and I look that way. But have you ever noticed sometimes you look and you don't really look, you just look? Boy, I started back and all of a sudden, beep, 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 beep. They weren't hoking, it was my warning thing. I stopped and I said, dear Jesus, thank you for that little beep, beep, beep thing. You know, most of us, most times I just stop, let the car pass and back out and go on my business. But I'm trying to thank God for He takes care of those little things. Those little things. I wasn't going to tell this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> I was talking with Pastor and in my hotel room, they have like a chase lounge. It's got a high back on one end and a high back and then open in here, and they've got a little table. So I was set up there with my laptop or my iPad doing some office work and writing some articles. And, and uh, I got up, and I went over there to pull the blind down a little bit. The sun was bothering me. And I turned around, and I got my foot caught in the end of that, Chase Lounge, and I fell onto the floor. Of course, you don't fall on the ceiling, do you? I fell on the floor, and I got tickled and started laughing about, you idiot, look what you did. And you know, I realized I could have broken my neck. I could have broken my arm. I could have cut a gash in my arm. All I have now is I'm just so sore I can hardly walk. But it was so funny. I mean, I just laid there and laughed for a minute, you know. And, and I called my daughter and tell her about it. And she just started laughing. I said, well, I'm glad you're overly concerned about your 79-year-old dad about ready to go to the emergency room. She kept laughing. But anyway, little things. Little things. You ever thank God when you come to church that your church has air conditioning? Do you realize that it's cooler right now in Pahrump than it is in Waco, Texas? Y'all ought to thank God for that. I mean, even if you only get five drops of water from the sky, you ought to say, dear God, you, couldn't have, you could have not given us anything. What I'm saying is we have to discipline ourselves to thank God. And as we begin to thank God, we become more aware of His presence in our lives. To me, one of the saddest accounts in all the Scripture is about the man Samson. We'll not turn there in Judges to read about that, but I want to sort of give you an overview of his life. 
Samson had made a Nazarite vow to Jehovah God. Won't take time to go into the whole Nazarite vow, but uh, people who paint pictures of Jesus and they give him that real long hair, they said it was because he was a Nazarite. He had made the Nazarite vow. He was, didn't make the Nazarite vow. He was a Nazarene. Why? Because he was from Nazareth. That's where they lived. He was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. But do you remember the Christmas story? They had made the long trip by donkey all the way down to Bethlehem because that was where Joseph was born. And all had to go register in the city of their birth. If Jesus had made the Nazarite vow, then he would have broken it because he touched dead people. A Nazarite vow would not allow a person to touch a dead animal or a dead human being. So Samson, I, I personally believe that Samson looked like a normal sized Jewish man. You know when I was a kid in Sunday school they'd show a picture of Samson. He about nine foot tall, looked like Goliath. Great big old bulging biceps and muscles. and I mean, he, he, no wonder he carried those gates out. Read Judges. When he did his exploits for God, it said, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. That's how he could do it. How can you and I be victorious? How can you and I have victory in our lives? How can we help other people? As the Spirit of God uses us. So Samson, he made this Nazarite vow to abstain from alcohols derived from grapes to refrain from cutting his hair. And by the way, his, his strength was not in his hair. It was in the Nazarite vow that separated him to God and the Spirit of God used him. He was to avoid corpse and graves, even those of family members and any structure which contained a dead body. You ever thought this about Jesus in his earthly ministry? He never attended a successful funeral. Every time he'd raise the dead. Don't you know the funeral directors hated to see Jesus coming in to the funeral? Oh, he's gone. He, he's up. And Samson's strength again was not in his hair, but in the vow that he made to Jehovah. And his fall was because he broke his vow to Jehovah. After Delilah cut his hair, she woke him with the pronouncement, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Now here's the sad part. He got up. And the Bible says, as he did at other times and knew not that the Spirit of the Lord had left him. Boy, if there's anything lacking in our churches today, it is an old-fashioned moving of the Spirit of the living God in our services in the lives of our people. Samson had not taken the time or made the personal decision to stay close to his God. You know what he wanted? He wanted that woman of the Philistines. His mom and dad tried to talk him out of it. Take a bride of our people. No, no. I want what I want. Now, folk, I don't want to, again, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I promise you, we are living in one of the most selfish ages that I personally have ever seen in the lives of people. It's what I want. It's what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and saying, not my will, but thine be done, O oh God. You and I can lose our closeness with Jesus, not our salvation, 
Our salvation is eternal. It is a gift of God. You receive it. And He's not a person who takes back His gifts. He gives us everlasting, eternal life. Amen. You cannot be close to Him though, without coming to Him. Is that not somewhat humbling? In other words, if you want God's blessings, if, if you want to be close to God, you must come to Jesus. It, isn't it amazing that sometimes our dogs obey us better than our kids? Y'all hearing what I'm saying? Sit. My daughter and my son-in-law, they have a miniature schnauzer. Her name is Bailey. That is the smartest one dog I've ever seen in my life. They, they put a little bell at the bottom of the door going through the garage where she goes outside to go to the restroom. And she goes on and rings that bell when she wants to go outside. What do you think your son or daughter do? You say, anytime you don't go to the bathroom, go ring a bell. Or you can tell Bailey, sit, and she will sit there until you tell her to move. The funny thing, though, is they don't allow her to be at the table while they're eating because they don't want her to beg for food. But she has a bed over there. So, Bailey, get in your bed. And she'll just go over and get in her bed. But she watches Kylie and Brindley, <laughs> my two granddaughters. And all of a sudden, uh, Paul comes out of that bed. Then she ooches over a little bit more. And Vonda will say, Bailey. She goes all the way back in that bed. But as soon as Vonda looks away, she starts that foot. But I want, her, I, I want to tell Vonda, stop, and let's see if she'll actually get out of the bed. No, Dad, we don't want her out of the bed. I know, but I want to see what she would do. <laughs> Have you ever thought about some things maybe that we're not willing to come to Jesus about? Lord, do you, do you really want my life? I mean, do you honestly really want my life? Your vocation? Can you say to the Lord, I am in the vocation that you want me to be in? You led me to do this. And by the way, He may have led you when you didn't know it, but you know now that He led you into it. Why? Because we're ignorant. God has to lead us sometimes beyond our ability to figure that out. Let me share this with you. This is not a trick question. Do you think it's God's will for Christians to live in houses or an apartment or an RV. You think it's God's will? Preacher and I do. Do y'all think that's God's will for Christians to do that? Okay, y'all do this. Yes. It is, all right. Then wouldn't it be God's will for a Christian to build that house? Yes. You think it's right for Christians to wear clothes? Oh, I do too. I could spend the whole time on that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Christians that ought to be making clothes for Christians. Hey, you think we ought to have indoor plumbing? Yes. Yeah. When I was a kid, we didn't have it at home. We had two rooms and a path. <laughs> My dad put uh, carpet in our bathroom. Mama liked it so well, he put it all the way up to the house. These kids, they don't. <laughs> no matter your vocation, God wants to lead you. Now, if you're in a vocation that a Christian shouldn't be in, listen, to, He wants you to change. No matter of success or failure, God wants to lead you. Because when God's leading you, you will never fail in His sight. Lord, do you really want my life? Secondly, Lord, do you really desire my love? 
you know, who, who am I that my love would mean anything to God as big and powerful and holy as He is? Why would my love? My love would mean something to Him because His Son loved me enough that He died for me on the cross. Do you think that God the Father would not want to love and be loved by someone His Son loved and gave His life for? I remember a week, about a week, maybe a week and a half before my wedding. At dinner one night, sitting there at the table, my my dad looked at me. I wish everybody could have known my dad. He had a dry sense of humor. He, he, he was funny. My dad looked at me and he said, Now, son, next week you're getting married. And he said, If y'all have any trouble, you can't come home. I said, What? He said, You can't come home. He said, She is so nice and sweet. I know it'll be your fault. <laughs> now, she can come here and stay. He said, you know, that bedroom in there, we had three bedrooms, and mine was in the front bedroom. He said, that's not your bedroom after a week from Friday. I said, well, whose is it? He said, it's a guest room. I said, you already have a guest room. He said, got two now. <laughs> you know what he was saying? I'm going to love her because you love her. I'm going to look after her and the amazing thing is we will love something or someone and we truly do need to love God Amen. do you know why God loves you listen to me very carefully it's not because we're lovely it's not because we deserve it it's because he decided to love us that's why it's unconditional. He decided to love us forever and forever. Do you ever stop and think about this? When did God start loving you? When you got saved? No. He started loving you before He created the world. I love, I love John 3.16. And I, I, I've said this, I don't know how many times in churches, but... Do you realize the reason Jesus came was not primarily that you and I would be saved. The primary reason Jesus came is because God so loved the world. That's why He gave His only begotten Son. Have you ever figured out it's easy to love someone who loves you? So many couples, young people, I want you to listen. So many couples get married with this attitude, I'll love you as long as you love me. But if you don't love me, I'm not going to love you. That is, if, if you don't continue to please me and do what I want, I just won't love you. God never does that. I love this. The Bible says, God hath no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I believe this with all of my heart that at the uh, great white throne judgment God will not be smiling when He puts people into the lake of fire because He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Why? Because they are part of the world. That world, word world, that's a tongue twister. That word world in John 3.16 is the Greek word cosmos. It means the human race. It means the inhabitants of the earth. Yeah, God doesn't love this world as far as the globe. That's why He's going to destroy it. Cleanse it by fire and give us a new earth and a new heaven. Because Satan's the prince of power of the air, the atmosphere. He's going to clean him all out of there and burn it up. Put them in the lake of fire. Lord, do you really desire my love? Answer, yes, he does. Yes, he does. 
Number three, Lord, do you really want my time, my talents, my total devotion? Absolutely. Why do you think God allowed you to have these talents, abilities, this time to live? Because He desires for you to yield those to Him. Besides being saved, on a spiritual realm, the greatest decision I ever made was when I decided for Jesus Christ to be my Lord. And I gave my all to Him. I gave Him my all. I was 21 years old. And I gave my all to Jesus Christ. Now listen to me very carefully. There have been times when I have taken that back because something appealed to me more than His Lordship. But I've always come back and said, Lord, I'm sorry. I give you my devotion. I give you my life. I give you my all. You think God really desires you to use the abilities, the talents, the time, just selfishly? No. It's for Him. That's why Jesus, looking at those followers, said, Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. If you desire to know how real you really are, I want you to test yourself, not out loud, not raising your hand, but I want you in, in your heart of hearts Ask yourself this question. How fully have I come unto the Lord? Not your salvation. You realize in salvation He came to you. No man can come to the Father except the Spirit draws him. But then I have the decision after He saved me. I have a decision either to keep my life to myself or to give myself away to Him. I found this to be true in my life, that in every area of our life that we aren't coming to Him, we aren't real, we will argue about it rather than come. Well, I could never do that. Lord, you're asking too much of me. Lord, you think I could? Lord, no, I, there's no, that's not God doing that, wanting me to do this. Well, it's sure not the devil. Can you imagine the devil coming to Brother Doug and said, Doug, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to go to Pahrump, Nevada and pastor South Valley Baptist Church. Besides retired people, who comes to Pahrump, Nevada? When Brother Doug told me where it was, I said, he's lying. I got on the map and looked to see if there was one. <laughs> but it had been easy, honestly, for Brother Doug to say, oh, boy, I know God not in that. See, when those areas that we fight to surrender, we argue. We argue with ourselves, and we argue with God about it. Now listen to me, folks. I don't care what it is, you're going to lose the argument. Not with yourself. You'll lose every argument with Him because He's patient. And I've seen people and watched people that they would rather suffer than come. I'd rather be out of the will of God rather than to do what God wants me to do. We'll do anything rather than humble ourselves and come just as we are. That's an old invitation song. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Listen to me, the only way a person can ever be born again is come to God just like they are. 
because anything else is reformation, not regeneration. Jesus will only accept you just as you are, but he won't leave you that way. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He changes us for his glory and for our good. As long as you and I have the smallest spiritual impertinence, it's going to always reveal itself in the fact that we want God to ask us to do something big. Boy, if God asked me to do something big, I'd do it. Yes, that is rain, folks. I know y'all hadn't heard it in a long, long time. (laughs) But we think God is going to want us to do something big. No, He wants us to give Him ourself. He'll take care. All He wants us to do is come. What's the greatest value of coming to Jesus in absolute surrender. Let me very quickly give you two or three things. Number one, it's crucial that we do it. It's crucial. This is the only place to receive salvation. Jesus Christ is the only Savior. No salvation in this church. No salvation in this nation. No salvation in your family. Oh, I'm saved because mom and daddy were. No. Listen to me. God doesn't save families. He saves individuals in families. There are preachers who will preach household salvation. Well, that's because there in the book of Acts, that jailer sprang in, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they'll say, Because the jailer got saved, his family got saved. The Bible doesn't say that. You know what Paul was saying? If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And if your family believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll be saved. Salvation is individual. Jesus saves us one by one by one by one. I shared this with one of the dear ladies uh, on Sunday. And uh, let, let, let me share it with you tonight. This, this is, I, I've done this uh, probably 500 times, 600 times. I'm going to let my knife be mine. Well, it reminds me, I've got to put that in my suitcase uh, tonight. <laughs> I've lost more pocket knives on planes. If you see me and I've got my britches on, I've got a pocket knife unless I'm on a plane. So this, this knife is going to be me, my soul. When I was 19 years old, I made a profession of faith when I was nine. But when I was 19 years old, out of high school, I trusted Christ. The Bible says that when you were born again, God placed you in Christ. This is my right hand. I'm left-handed, but I have to use this because I keep pointing with my left hand. So I am in Christ. So where am I? In In Christ. All right. Then the Bible says in Ephesians, I am sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. How many of you ladies know what sealing is? Remember when you, mama and grandma used to put up vegetables and they would seal those can or jars down? Then in the winter time you had those good vegetables? Man, yeah, we've already eaten. All right. So we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Then in John 10, this hand's God. It says, I and my Father are one. Now, did you get saved as a whole family or as an individual? Oh, yeah, I'm glad you were listening. All right. Individual. So if Satan wants to take you out of Jesus, first of all, he has to knock God off a throne. He can't do it. But for my story, he did. But then he has to break the Holy Spirit. He can't. But for my illustration, he did. Now where's my soul? In Christ. Where does he have to come to get it? In Christ. And if he got in Christ, he'd be saved. 
My soul is secure. My soul not only is saved, it's safe because I'm in Jesus. I love how Luke writes it in Acts chapter 4. He said, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none of the name given unto, uh, uh, given unto men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. What is that name? Jesus. You realize that name means Savior? He's the Savior. John 14, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no person comes to me, comes to God except by me. He's the door. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Not only is Jesus the only Savior, the Holy Spirit draws you, but you have to come. You can. Here's an amazing thing. God in all of His power, all of His strength, all of His wisdom, God has so ordained that He Himself will not violate your will. For Jesus to say, come unto me, that automatically tells you that some have the ability to say, I'm not coming unto you. I think if He was put it this way, you're getting to me tonight. Well, that means he gave us a command. This is a request, come unto me. I'm inviting you to come. Let me tell you something. You can say no to God, but there's a price to pay. Always, always. This is the only way you can become a true servant of Jesus Christ, and that's to yield everything to him. Not only because it's crucial, but we come to him because now this is the hard part. We must be conquered. Our will has to be conquered. How do we have our will conquered? By surrender. Giving up to God, giving up to Christ, giving up to the Holy Spirit. Each of us, we are going to serve something or someone. Each of us are going to follow either the world system or we're going to follow Christ as His children. And if you're living for this world, mark it down, you have not been conquered. I'll be honest with you, this old world just doesn't have very much I even want. Chicken fried steak. I'll take that. Ice cold watermelon, I'll I, I take that, you know. Good ice cream, sugar free, so I don't go into a coma. Come unto me. That's how we're conquered. Thirdly, come unto him because this is a place of comfort. I will give you rest. Religion will keep you in bondage. It will keep you under a load. Jesus Christ will keep you in rest and perfect peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Come unto me. When you hear these words, you will know that something must happen in you before you can come. The Holy Spirit will reveal that. What's keeping you from coming? What's holding you back? Why is it that people, and I ask myself all the time, preacher, I ask myself, I just don't understand. I know the human nature and all, but having now walked with God for 60 years, and seeing how God overshadows, helps, and leads, and provides. Why anyone? I know, but preacher, if I yield, he may make me do something I don't want to do. Oh, guaranteed. <laughs> guaranteed. Doesn't mean you're going to Africa. 
Doesn't mean you're going to have to move. The reason He conquers us is because He has things He wants us to do. And usually it goes against our old nature. But the greatest place is right in the center of the will of God. Will of God. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. But I want you to take my yoke upon you. I want you to hook up with me. And Jesus is saying, you and me together, we're going to walk down this path called life. And I'm going to give you rest. Comfort, joy, peace, provision, whatever you need, He will provide. Any questions?